All right, welcome everyone to this webinar on a very critical topic, one that's top of mind for many of us, equitable vaccine distribution, insights on COVID-19 from past public health emer emergencies. Uh, this, as some of you may know, if you've joined us before, is the third in a series of development dialogues. These are virtual panel discussions hosted by the Yale Economic Growth Center, the South Asian Studies Council, and the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. I'm Catherine Cheney. I'm a journalist focused on global development and actually a Yale alum. I'll be your moderator today. And I'm joined by several panelists who I'll introduce in a moment, Kei Gainty, Saad Omer, and Rory Stewart. As you all know, the pace of development for COVID-19 vaccines was nothing short of remarkable, but now we face a new challenge. And as is often said, vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do but many challenges stand in the way of equitable vaccine distribution. And today we're not just talking about equitable vaccine distribution to countries, but within countries and how do we reach the last mile? And it's not just about logistics and distribution, it's about politics and trust. And uh, the panelists we have gathered today are, are really a fantastic mix of perspectives to take this issue head on. So we'll be asking questions like, what are some of the most promising strategies to support the rollout of vaccines in order to contain the COVID-19 pandemic? And as I know we're all ready for, allow society to resume many of the educational, social, and economic activities that have been so disrupted over the past year. We're gonna look at policies and partnerships that can ensure, again, that vaccines reach low and middle income countries, as well as historically marginalized groups within those contexts. And like any issue we tackle in this series, and it's part of what I find so compelling about this series, we can look to history for lessons. So again, this series is about bringing insights from history to current challenges. The stakes of getting this right are very high. Um, and when we look at any of the challenges we face, for example, trust, the issue of trust in public health has posed a problem for decades. And if the global health community can overcome challenges of distribution as well as trust, there may be an opportunity to actually build trust ahead of future pandemics. So again, these are some of the big questions we're gonna be getting into. I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists and then we'll hear from each of them and dive into a discussion. And we want it to be just that, a conversation. So if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A box if you're joining us on Zoom and I'll pose them as, as I can. So I'll begin by introducing Kachin Gainty. She's a historian of 20th century medicine and technology at King's College London. Her research examines the systematization of medicine and healthcare and the way that notions of significance and effectiveness have evolved historically. She serves as the principal investigator for the Healthy Skepticism Project, which examines the role of medicine's critics and detractors, its dispossessed and antagonists in the constitution of its contemporary form. And I'll say, Kachin, I really look forward to hearing from you. Uh, I've heard a lot lately people really criticizing the way the public health community has dismissed questioners, as they're often called. Um, and then that, that leads them to um, feel that they're not heard and, and move even further away from ever trusting um, taking a vaccine, let alone the public health system more broadly. Um, Saad Omer is the inaugural director of the Yale Institute of Global Health. He is also a professor of medicine with a focus on infectious diseases at the Yale School of Medicine and the Susan Dwight Bliss Professor of Epidemiology uh, of Microbial Diseases at the Yale School of Public Health. Dr. Omer's research portfolio includes epidemiology of respiratory viruses such as influenza, RSV, and COVID-19. You can see why we have him here with us today. And he has conducted several studies on interventions to increase immunization coverage and acceptance. Uh, really looking forward to some of the insights he'll be sharing. As you may have seen in the promotional video, he made the very compelling point that we sink or swim together, which I think really captures why we need to get this right. And as always, we are really fortunate to have Rory Stewart, a senior fellow at the Yale Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, where he focuses on contemporary politics and crisis and on international development and intervention in fragile and conflict affected states, which I do hope we can get to today because when we talk about getting vaccines to marginalized groups or groups who might otherwise be forgotten in these fragile and conflict affected states, there are additional layers of complexity. Um, Stuart, as many of you know, previously served as the UK Secretary of State for International Development. So he can also bring that lens of the role that development actors can play. So I'd love to start with Kei Chin. Um, and again, Kei Chin, as I mentioned earlier, I think one of the really unique things about these conversations is we bring historians together with practitioners. So we're really grateful to have your historical perspective. Um, if we're kicking off this conversation by saying history offers lessons in, in what to do next, what can you share with us? Well, I think, I mean, one of the things that's been really important to me is to is, is rethinking this notion of vaccine 
hesitancy. Um, and I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from this rethinking. Um, and this is a really key, key, key part of the, of the kind of work I've been doing. And, and I, I think one of the lessons there is to, is to really take these hesitators seriously. Um, and to really not only recognize that there's a diversity of reasons why people hesitate, but also that there are real concrete historical, you know, moments that they bring up and talk about, but also that are clearly legitimately problematic about how vaccines and also healthcare has been done. Um, so I just wanted to say a few words about that to start with, uh, and then end with with what I think maybe that helps us to understand. Um, I, you know, when I've talked to um, people who are uh, vaccine hesitant, and and part of my project is to look at the history, but also to work with community organizations in London and in the UK, um, thinking about you know the reasons why that those communities are are vaccine hesitant. They they tend to bring up a lot of the same kinds of points that they distrust pharmaceutical companies, that they see them as. Um, in it for the money that they know about their histories of doing experimentation. So Pfizer and uh, its meningitis therapy study in Nigeria is one that constantly gets mentioned. Um, but Tuskegee constantly gets mentioned, which is interesting, I think, because it's a, you know, translating from the United States, the Tuskegee syphilis study um, of or untreated syphilis in the African American man translates into a London community as well. So these kinds of things travel and become part of this, this sort of heritage of, of being vaccine hesitant. Um, we see a lot in during the Cold War of vaccination as something that's sort of a way to broker deals or to gain access to particular kinds of countries. So, you know, in this very, in a simplistic way, it's we'll give you these vaccines if you allow us sort of a, an in, 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 in this area that we want to be. There's the example of Osama, Osama bin Laden and using the hepatitis B vaccine, uh, so sort of sham vaccination drive in order to find out uh, the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden and his family. There's all of those kinds of things that really are on people's minds even now. But there's also these sort of hidden costs of vaccinations that I think we don't talk about enough. And some of those hidden costs, one of those hidden costs has to do with what you can't do if you're doing um, a vaccine eradication campaign. Um, and so in the, in, in the 60s and 70s, when the World Health Organization took on the smallpox eradication campaign, one of the things that they, um, one of the drawbacks that they highlighted was the fact that therefore you can't really do primary preventive care, or you can't do it as much, you can't do it as often. Your emphasis really is on this emergency measure of vaccination. So you go in and you get out. Um, and there's a real sort of efficiency to that. But what they realized at the end of this eradication campaign was that that was not really effective, like in terms of overall health, really their, their goals needed to focus more towards more on building up healthcare systems, building up primary care uh, as something that was more fundamentally important than eradication. And um, so the sub subsequent to that, we get a polio eradication campaign that comes on the heel, heels of this smallpox eradication campaign. Um, and it's, it is the, the, the real sort of point of this campaign is to um, prove that uh, vaccination is, is better than primary preventive care in a sense. And so I think once you start to think about those kinds of stories, it starts to get you thinking about um, what is it actually that vaccination sort of, especially in the, in the global south, but also just in communities, you know, in, in the global north, what is it that it actually means to them? Um, is this just, you know, will rush in, give you a vaccination, rush out, and then that's it. One of the big problems with polio eradication is that polio was not the disease that a lot of countries were most worried about, but it was, this, it was a disease that could be eradicated by vaccination, it was felt. So there's even these kinds of mismatches that mean that distrust is not just on a very local level, but on a kind of more national level. Um, and so, and I think finally, this all sort of leads to what I've heard a lot recently, which is that um, historically, pharmaceutical companies are really problematic, not only in terms of the way they conduct their clinical trials, but also in the sense that when you take a vaccine, you are propping up a way of doing healthcare that is fundamental, fundamentally inequitable. Um, so even though you get sort of the instant equity of access to a vaccine, you're still kind of reproducing a system that you know is gonna you know, retain the same inequities 
that have always been in, in healthcare to that point. And that becomes a real sticking point when thinking about vaccination. And I think it should be a sticking point for us when we think about why do we you know, feel comfortable taking vaccines um, that even for us, there is a cost to taking this vaccine. Um, it's still worth it, but the cost is definitely this, this problem of, of sort of propping up the same kind of inequitable healthcare that we've seen over and over again. And so that leads me to the, to the final little bit I wanted to touch on was this, this question about what equity has meant in healthcare. So by and large, over the 20th century, equity in healthcare has really been about access. And it's been about this idea of taking a stable kind of regular, you know, the, the orthodoxy of medicine and allowing more and more people to have access to it. But the way that I see it in the communities that I've spoken to, and even sort of the skeptics that you see talking about this in the past, for them, healthcare equity really means inclusivity. It means a sort of place at the table in deciding what healthcare looks like to start with. And I think that's a really important thing. It'd be really wonderful to, to talk a little bit more about, about equity as we go forward. But I think historically, that's one of the lessons you really start to learn that the way that we that the way we define equity is al always already just a little bit inequitable, um, or at least it will feel that way to some. That's a really powerful point, and maybe a, a nice opportunity to transition to Saad here. Um, your point that equity is not just about access, but inclusivity in a place at the table. Um, and I don't know that that conversations on equitable vaccine distribution always uh, get at that really important distinction. So thank you for mentioning it. Um, and Saad, I think that's a nice way to transition to you. I know um, you've studied how to increase immunization coverage and acceptance. And I assume that that means not just access, but inclusivity. And I'm curious if you can um, share your broader points, but maybe touch on that point as well. Yeah, no, I think um, it's very reasonable to have a, and actually entirely um, needed to have a nuanced perspective of vaccine acceptance. Fortunately, uh, that has been uh, in the increase in, an increasing trend within the field that has been working on this um, issue more broadly. But often um, what gets portrayed in the public sphere and the public uh, um, uh, discourse, even on the, the so-called pro-vaccine side is a, a little bit of a caricature of the issue. Uh, if, you know, even for usual um, uh, uh, sort of uh, vaccine hesitancy, et cetera, for childhood vaccination, et cetera, is often um, uh, the fact that um, those who work on vaccine acceptance um, have been working in communities around the world, um, communities more directly, um, very directly, so more is a relative term, uh, in, uh, in um, countries in Latin America, uh, Africa, South Asia, et cetera. And, and the view is a little bit more nuanced than is often portrayed um, by even the pro-vax, the so-called pro-vaccine folks. And here's, here's the reason uh, why. It's easier to demonize a, a group of people as anti-vaxxers rather than um, having um, a more um, nuanced perspective. Uh, but we do know uh, that those who are vehemently um, against vaccines are a small, relatively small group. Um, there is a much larger group that is that has questions and that is hesitant. And but again, as I said, in the mainstream field of those who work on this issue, that's the an, an increasingly prevalent view, uh, and has been there for for last you know 10, 12 years. Um, uh, that that it is not. Um, it's the fence sitters. It's the folks who have questions. Um, and in terms of inclusivity, uh, in uh, as we broaden. Uh, the, um, the the access to vaccination, uh, albeit in, in not very equitable ways, but um, as we broaden to, uh, to to the general public beyond um, healthcare providers and the elderly, a, a big group is people with comorbidities, um, and and the fact that there is inequity in diagnosis of comorbidity, there's an inequity in diagnosis in access to information. Uh, around vaccination. So not everyone has their pediatrician's number um, on their phone and feel comfortable calling their pediatrician that requires a certain level of status, uh, relationship with your pediatrician and, and so on and so forth. Same thing with your cardiologist, et cetera. Most people in the world don't have a cardiologist uh, if, you, if you have that um, kind of a question. Uh, 
So a lot of inequity will, in, for, even from a vaccine acceptance side, uh, will come from um, inequitable access to information. Um, there will be, uh, in the context of COVID-19 vaccines specifically, um, there has been, uh, th there will always be, and there we know, knew, and, and it was highly likely that there will be a small group of people who would have accepted the vaccine, um, uh, no matter what. But there's a much larger group of people who have questions about this specific vaccine in terms of the process, uh, in terms of whether or not uh, the um, you know safety was ensured in the trials, why they were conducted in a way, and whether the regulatory uh, framework worked or not. I think um, having been involved with both sides of aspect, both on the vaccine acceptance side, and but also vaccine development and evaluation side, I think it is reasonable to say that a lot of the vaccines that are, are actually the mainstream vaccines that are out there, despite efforts to rush them along, uh, did follow the, the, the needed steps for an authorization. Uh, but, but that needs to be communicated with empathy. That needs to be communicated with the understanding that the question itself uh, is not unreasonable. Uh, but but the, the way we provide answers is, um, is, is where the focus should be. Uh, so so I'll, I'll pause here in, in the context of, of, of the fact that, um, uh, th that there has been an inequity in access to information and access to quality information. You're absolutely right. And uh, it's, it's a really important point. And another way I've heard this portrayed is um, so often global health practitioners just see the see it as critical to get the facts out there, right? But it's not just getting the facts to people, but how the facts are presented. And your point about empathy um, and coming from a place of empathy was really important. I, I wanna bring Rory into this. And um, Rory, I mentioned earlier uh, your background uh, leading development work in the UK and working um, with fragile states. And when we talk about access and inclusivity, um, you've worked in some of the contexts that are the very hardest places to reach. So can you can you just share with us your perspective on the way forward from here and, and any potential lessons from history or from your own, even recent history, your own experience? I mean, I, I, look, th this is a very, very complicated issue. And I think people have touched on some very important things. Um, one basic problem in talking about this is that particularly when you're talking about conflict affected states, there is almost no data at all. So if you take someone like Afghanistan, we simply don't have any idea how many people have had coronavirus. I mean, there's no proper testing processes. The um, attempts the WHO to try to provide estimates are based on scaling up from tiny polls for a few thousand people. So estimates range between 30% of the population, 80% of the population actually having had it. So answering an even more complicated question, which is what percentage of the population is refusing vaccines, or what percentage of the population is not gaining access to vaccines is almost impossible in these contexts. And, and I'd like to try to come back to Keichin and Saad to try to get a sense, because I think it's important probably for our whole conversation, what the scale of this problem is. Right? Are we talking about for the sake of argument, 20% of people refusing to take the vaccine, or are we talking about 3% of people refusing to take the vaccine? And that has quite a lot of impacts on the amount of resources you devote to this, this issue. I think the second thing is um, a very obvious point, but perhaps something that you know maybe is a kind of an ex-politician feeling that I need to be blunt on the call. Um, in some ways, of course, we are lucky to be having this problem at all. It is a pretty extraordinary miracle that we are in a situation of having this number of vaccines available this quickly. Um, and yes, there will be incredible problems and details around um, the issue of take up and trust. But a lot of the emphasis on government still needs to be on the basic logistics of getting this out, even getting the people injected who are prepared to be vaccinated. I mean, and one of the dangers sometimes within government is that we can get incredibly caught up in very important moral philosophical issues around exclusion, but miss the big story. So the big story is that even within the developing world, there is the most incredible gaps between um, countries that are managing 
to get a lot of people vaccinated and people who are not. I mean, to take examples, even within very, very mature, very wealthy, very prosperous states in Europe, you've got a gap between the United Kingdom, which has managed to vaccinate 15% of the population, which is over 10 million people, and states like Germany, which in many ways is a, you know, a, a more prosperous, more developed state that's only managed uh, about 2.3% of the population um, and about 2.7 million people. I mean, that's an incredible difference. And we don't even begin to understand this. Nobody has really good theories on understanding why this is happening. Um, it's particularly paradoxical because Britain seems to be rather bad at dealing with the prevention bit. In fact, it's got an incredible number of people who've died or contracted the disease. But somehow, whatever the British state was bad at in terms of controlling uh, transmission, it seems to have been much better at, at the logistics of getting vaccines. Out. And we don't get that. Is it something to do with the fact that it's not good at the moral and normative trade-offs in terms of what to lock down, what not to lock down, when to shut an airport, when to open a school, because those things are too complicated, but it's quite good. And this may be because the nature of the NHS, just at the practice of uh, getting the vaccine distributed and getting it into people's arms. And what is that? And what lessons can we learn from that to apply it to other bits of the world? And um, my final thing is to point out that the messenger is incredibly important on this question of trust. Um, and this is something we've touched on in previous uh, webinars. So in particular, in relation to the Bombay plague, which we looked at, the 1896 Bombay plague, very, very striking if you look at that, that the vaccine was treated with enormous suspicion. So Hafkine produced this vaccine for the plague. And for good reasons and bad reasons, people were very reluctant to take it. It seems that a lot of that was to do with suspicion simply of the colonial authorities. And that as time has gone on, many of what appear to be similar populations in India are more willing to be vaccinated by the non-colonial governments than they were by the colonial governments. Uh, and that seems to be a great deal not to do with the sort of things we're talking about, which is suspicion of pharmaceutical companies or money or but simply to do with the question of the legitimacy of the messenger. Do you or do you not trust the person who's bringing this thing to you? Enough for me. Thank you so much. So many things to pick up on there. I want to turn this into a conversation now and bring uh, Kachin and Saad back into the conversation. Also welcome questions from our audience. I already see some coming in, but keep them coming. I wanna begin by asking uh, something Rory posed, which is what is the scale of the problem? Um, and as Rory mentioned, there are certain contexts where we may not know the answer because there's not good data. Um, but we're hearing a lot about the problem of, of vaccine hesitancy. Um, and of course, when we talk about equitable vaccine distribution, that's only one challenge. We also need to talk about the logistics, as Rory said, which we'll get to in a moment. But when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, what is the scale of the problem? Kachin or Saad, do either of you want to jump in on that? I'd be happy to start. Great. Um, it depends on how you define it. Um, if whether it's um, willingness to accept without any concerns, or is it a willingness to not accept, uh, you know, with concerns or in between, um, you know, people with questions, but they will eventually accept. But, but, but um, you know, to look at the actual acceptance, potential acceptance, and I, I hope um, it's okay for me to quote those data in collaboration with uh, Mushfiq Mubarak uh, from Yale, our colleague uh, from Yale, um, so under his leadership there was, we collaborated on um, a series of country specific surveys and the um, acceptance, the projected acceptance in low and middle income countries ranged from 60 to uh, I think over 90% uh, and the median were around 80% for a potential COVID-19 vaccine. So most people are likely or intend to accept uh, the vaccine um, you know, obviously a lot will depend on the specifics, what kind of vaccines are deployed. That's why um, sort of I'm a big proponent of uh, independent recommendation process, independent uh, regulatory review, and then communicating that. So you cannot um, communicate uh, without having a substantive um, mainstream conflict free or with minimal conflict uh, process. And so so once you have that, uh, I think that that would inform the specifics of it. But but right now, uh, that seems to be the case. So this is a sort of a good news, but also cautious news story. 
so if in a country, if it's 60, 70, 80% uh, exceptions outright, that also means that there will be that last mile where we will have to communicate uh, effectively and empathetically to get to a herd immunity level, uh, level so that uh, control against this virus when it's achieved is sustained. Kachin, I'd love to hand it over to you. And when you mentioned um, Tuskegee and some of these other historical examples, uh, the way I've also heard that framed is this hesitance has been earned um, because of some of these very real um, valid reasons that have led to distrust in people. So um, kind of to build on Rory's question, I'd love to understand what is the scale of the problem and has the problem gotten worse or better over the years? I think another factor that hasn't come up in this conversation, but does seem to be a real driver of mistrust is social media. Um, so maybe that's something you could comment on as well. What's the scale of the problem and is it getting worse or better? I mean, I think the, I think, I mean, I'm really glad to hear what Saad had to say about what, what the, what the figures look like right now. And I think the, the, um, the reason for thinking about vaccine hesitancy at all is that um, we've been told, and I'm not the, you know, I'm not the right person to know whether this is, this is right, but that in order to achieve the kind of herd immunity we need, we need those, you know, those hesitant people to take the vaccine. And so that becomes something that, you know, because it's such a sort of, a, you know, we all have to do it essentially sort of situation. Um, it is worth it to really think about the people who, who hesitate and, and where their hesitation comes from. Um, and I think the scale of the problem has really sort of ebbed and flowed over time. So, so Rory's really right that earlier on in the 19th century and into the early 20th century, the real concern was about the state and what the state, what public health as an apparatus of the state would is doing to its citizens. Um, and that was a really important, uh, and, and you know, depending on the relationship between citizen and state that could work in favor of vaccination or could work against it. So we see multiple accounts um, early on in the 19th century of uh, people rejecting things like smallpox vaccination um, in, in part because of their distrust of, of the state and, the, and the, the way in which these public health campaigns came about around other kinds of campaigns that really targeted minorities, targeted you know, members of um, different ethnic communities, you know, different kinds of, of workers, different classes of people. Um, to have these public health things come along uh, sort of at the same time as a package with these things really gave it a, a flavor. Um, and you see instances like that throughout the um, throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. Um, Tuskegee, again, is another sort of distrust of, of the state sort of problem because this is the public health service who's who's running this. Um, and the but the general acceptance of you know, for 40 years, you know, to, to think it's fine to not treat people with syphilis um, in a very particular category of people, African American men, um, really creates a scenario where, you know, not only did the state not, you know, not, not only did the state sort of sanction this to start with, but nobody in the medical community stepped in to stop it, even though these things were published over 40 years into the 1970s. And so you see, yes, exactly, as you say, this is really earned, this, this kind of distrust, and these kinds of episodes really, really show it. But I think it's probably right to think that the character of trust um, and the people that matter in this equation has changed over time. So you really see mention of pharmaceutical, I mean, pharmaceutical companies are doing uh, throughout the 20th century are doing sort of shady things sort of all the way along and sort of in the nature of pharmaceutical companies to do this because they are at that one in the same time it giving you something to improve your health and also needing to make money um, in order to do more things to improve your health and so that's sort of a long-standing story but it really only comes into sort of the public consciousness later on in the 20th century. And I think they it, it starts to become a fear of, of big business, of these large actors, and less particularly um, about uh, you know, the, the way in which, at least in the 19th century, the state itself. So I don't think that I don't think that there's been sort of um, an, in, an increase necessarily in distrust. I think that the actors involved in that distrust though have have changed. And I think social media has certainly ramped that up. In, in made it so much more immediate than it had been in the past. Agreed, thank you. We do have some questions coming in and I wanna go ahead and turn to one of them because 
Uh, as we discussed earlier, the challenges here include distrust, but also distribution, as well as vaccine nationalism, which is something I hope we can get to. Um, but here's a question related to distribution. And the question is, what should be the key considerations in managing the distribution chain to minimize vaccine inequality across the globe for this and future pandemics, especially for fragile and conflict affected populations? Um, so I know this is something um, Saad has spoken about a little bit. Um, you know, in, in preparing for this call, uh, we had a conversation and you made the great point that it's not just about getting the vaccines to port, it's where do they go from there. Um, and then uh, the fact that, that this um, attendee is specifically asking about fragile and conflict affected populations. Um, Rory, I know you, you spoke to the challenge of um, data uh, in these contexts, but uh, there are also challenges of distribution. So let's talk about that. Um, either of you want to jump in first? I'm happy to start and then hand to Saad, who's much more expert on this than me. But I mean, I, I, the, I think the first thing to, for, for, for the audience on the call maybe to visualize is what's actually involved in trying to get vaccines to a population, for example, in a conflict affected part of Somalia. Or let's imagine you're operating around the rural areas of Helmand in, in Afghanistan. You're talking about accessing, accessing areas which are controlled by insurgent groups. So they're not controlled by the government itself. The only way of accessing, let's just take Afghanistan as an example, the only way of accessing rural areas in Helmand is to access areas which are controlled, literally controlled by the Taliban. You effectively need a passport from a Taliban commander in order to enter that area and work in that area. There are checkpoints set up all the way along the road. You just can't get in, doesn't matter. You could be a from the WHO, you could be from uh, the Afghan government, doesn't matter, you can't get in. So the first logistical problem you have to overcome is the hesitancy that you may be having to overcome and may not be from the population as a whole, but from the leadership of the Taliban, right? I mean, this is a sort of odd issue, but it's an issue that would apply in the Central African Republic, it would apply in South Sudan, it would apply in Somalia, would apply in bits of DRC. You have to convince effectively a militia leader of what you're doing. You have to convince them, of course, as, as Kachin pointed out, that you are genuinely trying to get vaccines in there. Because remember, these people are extremely concerned that what you're actually doing is going in to gather intelligence, or you're setting up drone strikes, or you're involved in some form of counter-terrorist or counter-insurgency operation, and you're just cloaking yourself in vaccine delivery. And then you need to overcome their own understanding of this vaccine and suspicions around this vaccine as somebody actually actively trying to poison them. It's an act of war. Once you've overcome that, then the question is, how do you really monitor your teams on the ground? So let's say you are the Afghan government, you've contracted with uh, health workers or with an NGO to get the vaccine in, and they say that they've injected all these people. Have they really? It's a very dangerous area. What happens if the health workers decide they don't really want to go to these villages? They want to pretend they've been to these villages and that they've vaccinated people. How would you ever find out whether they've done that or not done that? Okay, enough from me, over to Sad. Yeah, no, I think uh, access is, um, is more nuanced than just getting it to a country. And so often the global equity is formulated recently um, as uh, distribution to countries. It's not that the key players do, are not aware of it. It's just that, that this is this the first step, um, but and, and and it's a it's a marathon run at sprint speed, um, and and so therefore we need to go all the way. And and the way to do that is to have a three sixty degree perspective on which populations are getting this uh, vaccine, to have a clear public health strategy. So as part of the, so I have had the privilege of being part of the WHO SAGE um, uh, COVID-19 working group. And one of the, the two initial products that came out of that process, the first was a values statement, um, a, a values framework actually that countries can use or modify or object to. Um, and that included uh, values such as um, within country equity and global equity, but more or also specifically legitimacy of the process. Um, we have started seeing um, the news of, you know, in, in a few countries where political leaders have 
started in, in low income countries where the need is, uh, you know, the bottleneck is even much tighter uh, in terms of vaccine access, uh, political leaders have bypassed the process and have uh, gotten uh, the vaccine without being in the high priority risk group. What it does is, frankly, in terms of the um, the actual numbers, it has less of an impact uh, because uh, you know elites are just that they're a smaller group of people if you look at it numerically. But it undermines the trust uh, in the in the process. So in terms of distribution, how these things are distributed, that also uh, has an element of trust. But then uh, articulating the clear, so the second document that came out of that process was a. Uh, prioritization framework. And that uh, explicated, depending on your country situation, uh, what public health strategy you should have. And, and that's very important. Often we just go in and say uh, as many vaccines as possible and you know whatever, uh, but, but there is a key to it. There's a, uh, a smaller fraction of people that is um, associated with higher number of deaths. So if we reduce deaths, uh, you, you, you know, in order to interrupt transmission, uh, you will need much higher number of vaccine doses than to reduce deaths if you target the people who are at higher risk of dying. And so that's an important point. And so therefore, where it comes, when it meets distribution is that you're, if your distribution is targeted, if your distribution is um, focused on, for example, uh, you know, beyond healthcare workers who are at high risk, not the whole healthcare system, but the healthcare workers at high risk, there are specific definitions based on the ILO definitions of exposure to the virus. Um, and in certain countries that includes uh, immunization workers and that kind of stuff who are going into communities, et cetera. So if you, after that, if you're focusing on uh, older populations, people with um, other risk factors, you are ensuring uh, that you are reducing mortality and severe disease head on uh, and even before you get to a, a level of uh, uh, vaccination that actually interrupts transmission. And, and to ensure that you would require engaging specific communities because not everyone comes to the health center, making sure that the undocumented, so, so one big tool are the national ID cards that uh, governments are using uh, to um, identify people in risk groups. I'm not entirely against that, not against that as, as one of the tools, but also considerations of the undocumented populations within those countries. They are often uh, internally or externally displaced people and some of living in the highest risk uh, situation. So that's one place where distribution meets equity, but also the choice of vaccines. So I'm really heartened by the vaccines uh, that are coming that have better refrigeration requirements, um, uh, et cetera. And so, so it's all, both macro and macro level sort of uh, planning that will narrow the gap um, in the right direction. Thank you, um, can, I, can I just very quickly just come in also on the related issue, which is that given that there is a very limited supply of these vaccines and the demand in every country exceeds the supply, um, that means that in many countries, there is a very significant risk of corruption. Um, we can see this in the United States and Canada, right, where people are trying to jump the queue and get hold of these things. But if you imagine yourself in a much weaker state in which there's much less surveillance, um, these problems become incredibly extreme. Right? The vaccines that make it into a country may become incredibly valuable on the black market. Right? And, and here, paradoxically, the fact that wealthy people are more likely to trust the experts and more likely to want the vaccine becomes a problem for corruption. So just to follow it through, the health worker confronted, I don't know, uh, with an undocumented community or with a community um, which is marginalized and which is reluctant to take the vaccine may well not have much incentive to really push their case for them. They may be quite willing to accept saying, oh, well, that community doesn't really want it. There's no point really trying with them, particularly when there is so much demand from more powerful people and often more powerful people who are prepared to pay a great deal of money for this. Okay. Thank you, Rory. Kachin, were you going to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, one of the things, I mean, this reminds me, this conversation reminds me of is, 
um, the work of Simokai Chuguru, who, who talks about the fact that vaccines, vaccination is always political, this whole, you know, epidemic diseases are always political in this really fundamental kind of way. So that's in some, in some way, um, to treat them as though they are sort of, you know, medical or biological becomes sort of ironically, um, you know, makes less sense, makes little sense, because the, the things that really matter about not only about distribution, but about the, the, you know, the presence of the vaccine at all, tend to be these kinds of um, political co considerations more primarily. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think it gives us some vantage point, thinking even historically about the way in which vaccines have been a vessel or sort of this, you know, this uh, a piece of significance that carries all sorts of the political crises of a time and of a place within them, um, because they, you know, they, they, they are so, uh, you know, needed, necessary, wanted, and also so contentious and so problematic in so many different kinds of ways. Um, and one of the things that uh, the, the kind of scientific community in the 1950s and 60s was really interested in is, um, you know, the question of whether vaccines are really everything there they should be, you know, are they really the, the end all be all that we want them to be, particularly when they are so political. So, you know, what are the chances that they, as they expressed it, what are the chances that actually these kinds of eradication campaigns or these kinds of vaccination campaigns ultimately, you know, have the desired effect? Um, and is there some reason to think, I mean, they had sort of the more radical view that vaccination campaigns didn't touch some of the major epidemics of the time um, didn't really touch the, the disease itself. They came sort of afterwards, after the disease was already running its course and in decline. Um, and I'm sure that's been debunked, but it's sort of this interesting sort of thought experiment about, uh, about how vaccines relate to epidemic disease, um, at not as these kind of obvious solutions to it, but as another feature of the larger problems that epidemic diseases contain. I think it's a really interesting point. I mean, I think the global health community's perception of um, a vaccine as a solution is changing. And um, Rory, I'd actually love to bring you into this because I, a big part of what I cover just as a journalist covering development is the role of philanthropy. And I think a lot of philanthropy and you know, the Gates Foundation comes to mind. Part of, part of the interest in vaccines among global health philanthropists is getting to zero. And this idea that it's just a shot in the arm, but um, actually, as Kachin just pointed out, increasingly we're realizing it's about trust. It's about politics. It's far more complicated than that. Rory, did you see that in your time working in development? Well, I, I think you put your finger on something very interesting. I mean, one of the things that has attracted Bill Gates, for example, towards vaccination is that he's often been looking for something in development which while not easy, I mean, nothing in development is easy, is at least more straightforward, he feels, than other parts of development. So I remember a conversation with him where he said he basically got out of education because he thinks education is impossibly difficult and there's no point getting involved in education. Vaccination, on the other hand, at least in this conversation three years ago, he saw as a much more logistical technocratic issue. Great advantage is education, goodness knows what's happening. Children in school, teachers, curriculums, unions, complicated. Vaccination seems on the surface as though it's just about, as you say, sticking something in somebody's arm and something that you ought to be able to organize. Uh, and, and indeed, um, you know, as I've been saying, the, the UK's success in vaccination suggests that um, you know, governments set up in the right way can do these things logistically quite ably in a way that they maybe struggle with some of the more complicated philosophical moral questions to do with lockdown. However, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought you had finished. I no, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, was, I shouldn't. I should have. However, um, as, as you've pointed out, Catherine, in reality, of course, vaccination turns out to be much more complicated than people thought. And that all these questions of politics, trust, belief, uh, begin to come into the question of vaccination. And it's going to be very interesting to try to get a sense of how somebody like Bill Gates begins to respond because he's got a mind that's very much focused on a logistical technocratic solutions. And now he's dealing with a disease, which as I say is deeply embedded in trust, ethnicity, identity, and in certain countries, conflict, corruption, uh, and ultimately politics with small and big pieces. 
really fascinating points. And I'm, I'm very interested to follow how this experience with COVID-19 vaccines and seeing how complicated uh, this effort really is might affect other uh, vaccine efforts and, and support for it. Saad, go ahead, you're gonna jump in. Yeah, so I was gonna sort of make the point, I think uh, vaccines should not never be con uh, considered a simplistic, um, the only solution uh, to a public health problem. But uh, on the other hand, vaccines are a key part of a comprehensive public health strategy. So we should remember that just with smallpox vaccine, reasonable estimates indicate that we save uh, you know, approximately 5 million lives um, a year, um, et cetera. And, and I would say that even if you further become conservative in your estimation, et cetera, that other things we would have had better treatments, et cetera, uh, during that period, you would still be talking about um, millions of lives a year uh, from smallpox, just as an example. Uh, the fact that polio uh, vaccination efforts um, have, we haven't, you know, uh, eradication, global eradication is a binary phenomenon. It's uh, versus one versus, you know, you know it depends on the, the last case uh, being eliminated in the sense that last case being prevented. And so it is, uh, but even to, after getting to the, 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 uh, the efforts to get to the 99.9% .9 reduction, uh, it has been, um, has been worthwhile in terms of actual lives. You could argue uh, that uh, when would be the time to say, and reasonable people have argued against further efforts around polio eradication. Uh, I have a slightly different perspective for now, but it's not a, an infinite perspective that, that, uh, that, that polio eradication would be worthwhile 20 years from now, for example, if you haven't gotten uh, there to, to set up a counterfactual. But, but the fact that, um, these, that vaccines have been part of saving real lives uh, should always be kept in mind uh, and have been the most, one of the more effective and cost effective. And, and increasingly, and it's not cost effective for Bill Gates or uh, Western governments, it's cost effective of countries who are taking, a lot of countries for COVID-19 vaccines are paying out of pocket. Uh, Co, uh, uh, COVAX AMC facility is, uh, you know, for a lot of observer is playing a significant but a smaller than expected role in countries' portfolio, uh, et cetera. So, so we should keep in mind that in, in these kinds of interventions, vaccines are not the sole tool, but are an important tool in the tool set. Can I can I just jump in there for a second? Um, I mean, that's really interesting to hear and, and, and really makes a lot of sense. And I think one of the problems may be that um, the way this is expressed is really that we spent a lockdown waiting for a vaccination to release us, right? And, and, that, and there is this kind of um, feeling in the public sort of more generally, at least here in the UK, um, that, you know, that's how it is. It's sort of, you, we went into lockdown and we were happy to do it because we knew eventually a vaccine would come along and then we could leave it and go back to life as normal. And I think, as you say, that's kind of a really dangerously simplistic way to understand what's going on here. But I think at the same time, it is the way that we understand going on here, or, or it, a, a lot of us do. Um, and so I think, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's something to be said for talking more about what are the other, you know, what are the other public health things that happen at the same time. And I think, I mean, for me as a historian, you know, the the uh, sort of thinking about smallpox eradication, but also thinking about vaccination just in general. I mean, what's so interesting about it is it, it, it's, it's that it is the first and the most effective and exciting miracle cure that medicine has. And so the kind of healthcare that we chose, it, it wasn't obvious that the medical orthodoxy that we now hold as orthodoxy would always be the medical orthodoxy. There were in fact many competing sort of examples of what healthcare ought to look like. But we chose this one, and one of the primary features of this one is that it has these, um, these miracle cures. So you see that vaccination, then you see that with antibiotics, and it's kind of a trope that happens over and over again. And so it, it seems to me potentially that we're so sort of acclimated to that way of thinking about healthcare that thinking about healthcare another way is actually very difficult. You know, to, to think that um, actually, uh, you know, the way to tackle 
um, the virus, the COVID, is to uh, is is you know to to do all of these other sort of public health sorts of ideas is really foreign to us unless those things are being done in order to get to the vaccination. And for me, that's really an inheritance of how we've done medicine over the late 19th and, and 20th centuries. Um, and it's not something that's, you know, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily good. I mean, I think one of the questions that this really wonderful community organization that I work with in, in London, as I mentioned, um, one of the questions they really have is, you know, is there, you know, in a different model of healthcare that maybe is the model of inclusivity, um, you know, would public health look different? Uh, would it be the case that we would not be thinking about vaccination, but we would be thinking about other kinds of public health measures, um, or maybe even, you know, after the smallpox eradication campaign, really thinking more and more about primary preventive care to begin with, maybe those are also things that, um, you know, might seem now like they are an alternative way forward, not a not a realistic way forward, I guess. So, so I would love to know what alternative um, um, ways of thinking would get us out of a pandemic or would have um, sort of gotten us uh, into a situation. I agree that the, the healthcare system is inherently uh, uh, inequitable. Um, and it is producing inequ inequitable outcomes. In the US, uh, the richest country in the world, um, prior to vaccination, uh, but that means a, a clean uh, situation where not necessarily everyone was waiting for uh, vaccines. The public health professionals had that, but, but uh, it wasn't at all certain that that would be a way out until phase three data started uh, coming out. And even in the emergence of variants, it's not 100% certain that that would be you know, the exclusive way out. Uh, but within that, um, uh, within that clean experiment, without the vaccines, in the U.S., uh, Black and Latinx mortality is approximately three times higher. Um, and if anything, eventually, um, when uh, when you're protecting mortality for everyone uh, disproportionately because of the inherent inequities, and and I would say, and based on the main mainstream public health thinking or, 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 or reasonable thinking that vaccines are considered part of primary prevention. It's not secondary prevention that you give after you have had a disease. So we'd love to hear what are other counterfactuals that would have prevented this uh, enormous mortality, um, not just morbidity um, in, in a specific sense in this pandemic. Well, I can't answer that question. I'm a historian. I can only, I mean, I, you know, for me, it's only that, you know, sort of historically speaking, this is sort of the, you know, you see this it become inevitably the way we do medicine. And I think the, the, the kind of interruption of that is only to say, you know, what, what could, you know, what could be the alternative? So if, you know, so to ask sort of, if we were to build a more inclusive healthcare system, you know, what would that then look like? Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't know at all. I have no sense of, of what else there would be, but I do know that so from the early 20th century onward, the sort of fixation on a certain way of understanding healthcare and what it does means that other avenues that exist at the time cease to exist. And so those other avenues have much more to do with kind of more holistic, more preventive care, um, preventive, not necessarily in terms of vaccination, but preventive sort of in these, these sort of primary, making sure you're you know, fit, making sure you have enough to eat, making sure you have housing, like those kinds of ways. Um, and that those, those really sort of fall by the wayside in favor of a way of doing medicine that's much more dramatic. That's not to say it's not effective, of course. I mean, it's extremely effective, um, but it's also to say that there is maybe still some wiggle room in how we think about healthcare more generally. But I don't wanna, I'm, I don't wanna get too far away from, from the, uh, the, the topic, but it would be great to talk to you more about this at another time for sure. Can I, can I, I mean, I, I think there's also a very interesting thing which, which um, Katyn and, and Saad have both got onto, which, which strikes me very directly as a politician. Um, as politicians, we're normally involved either in ordering people to do things, things which are compulsory, obligatory, like sending your child to school, for example, or obeying the police. Right? Or we're involved in voluntary things like trying to encourage people to eat more healthily. But 
This is a particularly extreme example of something which is ultimately voluntary, whether or not you take the vaccine, but where we're trying to get as close as possible to universal take up. And that requires a very particular form of political persuasion, argument, rhetoric. Right? And thinking closely about how it is you convince people to do things and taking on Kachin's point, which is that it's not just a question of suddenly waking up with a coronavirus vaccine and convincing people to take it. It's something you should have been doing for 40 years earlier, right? convincing people to trust the whole system. And, um, and trying to understand the way our own minds work. I mean, to what extent is scientific evidence important or not? I mean, for most people on the call, uh, with the exception possibly of Saad, most of us will take the vaccine without having a great deal of understanding of how the vaccine works. We will take it because basically we trust doctors, right? Um, so it isn't necessarily a question of, um, as one might suggest, of sort of science against anti-science. It's a question of two forms of trust, right? And understanding what it would mean to convince you, me, somebody in Afghanistan, somebody in a marginalized community in the United States, goes to the heart of the whole question of politics, which is the question of debate, argument, persuasion, communication, and the way in which we do those things. Thank you, Rory. And you directly touched on a question that came in. Um, we have just a few minutes left, so I'll just see if any of our panelists have further reaction. But there was a good question here. We, we talked earlier about the importance of not just the message, but the messenger. And the question coming in, um, says that in terms of vaccine acceptance, I noticed the media seems to focus a lot on vaccine efficacy. Um, and then we have a few examples here. Um, the question is, what kind of narrative should the media, public, politicians be focusing on? And Rory just touched on, I think, um, the delicate dance that politicians have to do right now. Um, but we haven't really touched so much on the media as well as the public, all of us, um, what kind of narrative should we be focused on? So with just a few minutes left, any final thoughts from our panelists on that important question? Oh, Saad, you're on mute there. I was planning to mime my way through this question, but uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I think um, uh, we would be doing a disservice if we uh, don't strike a balance between what is known and what will be known soon. Um, Etc. So, give you an example. So, in terms of selling it enough, uh, in terms of based on what we know versus overselling it. Uh, uh, for example, the framing, the appropriate scientifically backed framing, is uh, that the benefits substantially uh, outweigh the risks, rather than saying that there are zero risks involved. Um, and that's a. It's been shown in, again and again. Um, that uh, if you downplay risks uh, beyond what is justifiable, for example, uh, a vaccine like uh, HPV vaccine, which is remains controversial, but has had many years of experience, etc., has a different level of follow-up compared to a vaccine, um, which is an mRNA vaccine, um, uh, which is there. I, would I take it? Yes, absolutely. Um, in terms of do uh, benefits outweigh risks, not not even close. Uh, but to acknowledge that uh, uh, that we have, you know, a vaccine that whose safety is continued to be evaluated, and to say that th here's the reason why we reassured, here's the reason why we say that the, the benefits outweigh the risks is that uh, based on the, our understanding of biology and previous vaccines, most of the, an overwhelming majority of the events happen um, within the next, uh, within the first six weeks. Um, in terms of understanding, uh, you know, meeting people where they are in terms of they're concerned about long-term effects and why there is less concern than, than they may seem in the scientific community about so-called sort of long-term effects, um, and so on and so forth. And while acknowledging that we continue to learn about this vaccine using uh, some of the broadest vaccine safety surveillance uh, the world has seen. So I think the framing should be that the benefits substantially outweigh the risks rather than saying uh, that there are zero risks engaged with, the, with this vaccine. Thank you, Saad, well put. Did Kachin or Rory, do either of you wanna jump in as we close here? I mean, very, very quickly, just to say, um, We've also got to watch politics on this very closely. It's it's very striking that so far 
politicians around the world have not really jumped on the bandwagon of attacking these vaccines and making it a central part of their politics. But as science says, there's a huge gap between the way in which we would like to talk, which is to say the risks are outweighed by the benefits and the way that politicians normally talk. Politicians don't like to acknowledge risks. They like to make things as simple as possible. They're terrified that admitting any nuance or complexity is providing an opportunity for their opponent to jump in. They want things very, very black and white. And, and those, that's two problems. One of them, uh, getting the balance right between the way in which a doctor would want to communicate this and the way a politician would want to communicate this. But the second risk is that, of course, that then provides an opportunity as soon as that nuance or doubt enters for a politician that then takes the other side. Thanks. Thanks, Rory. Kajin, we'll go to you for any final thoughts. I mean, just on that, I think what Rory and Saad have said are, are really, really insightful and really smart. And I think, you know, part of the stuff I've, I've, I've been thinking about is also to do with science skepticism more generally. Um, and this notion of being able to portray science as something that's nuanced, something that's this kind of knowledge production system that is really, um, you know, does does what it does really, really well. Um, and being able to present that, uh, you know, in this way as risk benefit rather than just must do it, you know, or, or not or whatever is, is really makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Well, we're at time. This has been a fantastic conversation. Um, you all make my job easy as a moderator because it was really a conversation with one another. So thank you. Um, and I, I want to thank our organizers as well. Um, the Yale Economic Growth Center, the South Asian Studies Council, and the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. We hope you'll join us for um, future iterations of this series and we can continue to learn from history as we face these very tough challenges. And uh, I think I would just end by saying equitable vaccine distribution is not just the right thing to do, but the only effective way forward. And I think we have some really valuable insights from this call on how to do that and what we can learn from uh, history. So thanks to each of you and thanks to all of our participants.